today's webinar again about pricing and revenue management methods and the role of machine learning. Um, pretty interesting uh, webinar, um, I think. Let's go maybe to the next page, just kind of introducing um, our host today. Um, our founder, uh, Ingo Reinhardt, will be speaking mostly today, um, and I will be moderating. He has um, a lot of experience in pricing and revenue management. He also developed the method of Bionomics. I'll see what that means in a second. And um, yeah, it's kind of the subject matter experts um, today. And I'm Paul, I'm head of sales at Bionomics, um, leading um, content and insights teams as well, and uh, previously worked in consulting in uh, various um, roles related to pricing, consumer goods, et cetera. Um, and um, yeah, we're Binomics to everyone who doesn't know us yet. Um, we are have a software which makes it um, easier, better, faster, and more accurate um, to make good decisions. And um, yeah, we're here today to kind of showcase the way we're thinking about the subject matter, but also how our solution can help with that. Um, yeah, so feel free to reach out after the session as well to find out more about that. Uh, but with no further ado, Ingo, I think um, we have an interesting topic today. So I'll leave it to you to, to take it away in terms of um, today's presentation. Perfect. Thanks, Paul. Um, and thanks, everyone uh, who, who, uh, who has joined today. Um, and uh, if you have a question on anything, please write them into the chat um, and uh, we're happy to answer them towards the end of uh, today's session. Um, as Paul already said, today's topic, I think it's, it's key to, to the jobs of many of us, um, pricing, revenue management, um, and uh, we want to put that into the context of machine learning because that's also uh, what our focus is as a company, what uh, we're working on, um, and because that, of course, we're very eager to talk about the topic um, and spread the word. So um, be before we get into the details, I think it, it's fair to start a bit broader into the topic um, because pricing revenue management is not just price elasticity, it's not just setting the right price, but it's embedded in, in many different things. Um, there is, and the, the job of a pricing manager, revenue manager, is to be able to put all these things together and produce the proper outcome in the end. And often that outcome results in setting shelf prices, defining through different levers, um, the net prices, defining what portfolio has been offered and so on. And to do that well, different things are important. Um, access to the proper data that typically involve sales data to understand uh, what's been sold um, at different levels, uh, at different prices. Um, that's easier in some industries, more difficult in other industries to understand also, particularly to understand um, what competitors are doing, what prices they're offering is often easier, but it's of, in some industries more difficult to understand how, how much sales they have. Um, so that data, of course, is very important. And there are some things that are easier or can be assisted by other means. Um, for example, if you want to test something new that hasn't been sold in the past, it makes sense to look at surveys. Uh, ask customers to certain studies, conjoint studies or other pricing studies to get the insights. Um, <clears throat> and of course, there are different uh, objectives in pricing um, that um, pricing revenue measures need to be aware of, profit optimization, revenue optimization, market shares. Some of these can be important in some phases of the industry, um, but I think long-term um, as the, the profit focus should be the most relevant for, for a company. Uh, and of course, there are different tools that are available for pricing. I think in most cases, at least in our experience, um, Excel still plays a major role. Of course, there are some online tools that focus on, on price management, help you optimize um, or, or manage your portfolio that is more relevant or less relevant depending on how many products you and prices you need to manage, how often they change and so on. But what we see is, and that's, that was for us the motivation to start with Binomics, uh, a lack, I think, of an integrated tool that can bring these together with a proper method that's capable of really optimizing prices, optimizing the portfolio, the, the architecture, and everything around that. Um, and the way this is often done is 
via different methods um, and for pricing let's go already to the next slide i think for in our experience the the five key methods and we're interested in understanding um, what what you're using are cost based pricing i think it's often by many by many consultants been positioned as as something bad but i think in it's it's it, I think it gets less credit than it deserves um, because particularly in established markets, something like cost-based pricing is, is a bit better than its reputation uh, similar. So the idea is that you have a cost base you, and you add a fixed margin on top to get to your price. Similar in, in method is competitor pricing. You, you look at what your competitors are pricing their products and then you add or subtract depending on where you see yourself in the market. This is often done very often, <clears throat> of course, price elasticity based pricing plays an important role, particularly when we're now in a few minutes talking about um, machine learning. This is this is something that's very key to pricing, understanding how changes in price affect changes uh, in, in sales volumes. Value based pricing often um, used by many um, um, pricing managers, where um, what, what we often see is, um, I think everyone agrees that it's important to understand how customers value a product and that needs to be considered in the price decision. Um, actually doing that in practice has a, has a number of challenges uh, and some of them we will address here, uh, particular because there's not the one customer, but every customer has a different uh, attaches a different value to a product so um, this makes it a bit more difficult because there's not this this one value that the customer attaches to a product but there's a full distribution of different values uh, and of course uh, particular in in later time behavior pricing is becoming very important um, as an addition to the other methods and the key idea is to acknowledge that people are not fully rational in their decision and they can be steered towards certain decisions by um, by so, sort of exploiting um, the heuristics that people use so for example um, pricing something at 9.99 instead of 10 euros um, because 9.99 looks a lot cheaper than 10 euros to most people. So the, these are, from our experience, the, the main methods that are being used. Um, and I think, Paul, we intended to have a quick survey to understand which ones of these are you using, or even if you're using something totally different, um, we, we'd be interested in that. And we have prepared a quick poll, poll on this. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think, if I'm not mistaken, you have to activate that poll. Um, do you, can you see it on the bottom mm -hmm. here otherwise i can just ask it in the chat that's no problem um ah there it is <clears throat> let's give everyone just a few seconds to kind of chime in um it's also interesting to see what everyone's using again it's a multiple choice so if you're using a combination of um methods then uh, feel free to uh, select multiple ones and it will just be uh, interesting to kind of get a feel for um the most used methods um, at the moment from you guys as subject matter experts um, from the field. Ingo, how's it looking? How many uh, answers do we have? Should we start closing the poll or give this, these guys a bit more? It's two time? thirds, say okay. another five seconds and then Perfect. we're so done. Just uh, click on whatever applies to your poll and then we'll close then it in. And can you share the results? Oh, interesting. What do you make make of this, Ingo? So I, I think it's as expected. Um, so a lot of competitive pricing, elasticity, everything matter. I, I would have thought people pay more attention to, to behavioral aspects. So that's certainly something that um, uh, can become more important. But I think that the major point here is that um, most people use a combination of different um, different methods. That's also why we allowed to give multiple answers. Um, um, I think that plays well into uh, how we're seeing it because what in our experience, what we what we find a lot is that um, just as and that's supported by by your answers is that in most cases people use a multitude of of, of techniques and and, and methods. Um, and here's just one example. I think that's that's a, that's something that I've seen in my, my previous 
life as a consultant a lot that these methods are being combined for example you have something like uh, when you think of a, a product range you have something as a base margin for a product category then differentiate the the price based on certain value drivers where you say okay i have something like good better best product structure and then you say okay the i have let's say 30% price difference between my products, then you have um, a price structure check if that's comparable to what your competitors would price because you don't want to be way above or below your competitors. Um, and then from there, you typically add some price cosmetics. So that, that's something that's uh, that relates to the behavioral aspect. So for example, you might put your price on, on a price threshold or you um, set up your prices in a way that you say, okay, <clears throat> I put a, a very high price, a high price product at the top, but I don't expect people to buy it, but it serves um, as, as a way to increase the price anchor or the, the value perception of my customers. And typically across the field, people consider something like a price elasticity where they say, okay, if I increase or decrease my whole portfolio, I will lose or gain profit or revenue uh, or whatever they're aiming for. So th that's something very typical. And of course, this poses a number of challenges. I think the, the most important one is that these different methods, they don't work well together. Um, for example, if you have something like, um, so for example, like something like competitor pricing, it's, it's not clear um, how much or you should price above or below a certain competitor. What do you do if uh, value pricing and competitor pricing give you different indications? So value pricing suggests you in should increase the price of a product. Competitor pricing um, suggests that you de should decrease it. It's, it's really not clear how to, uh, how to resolve many of these challenges. Um, but I think from what I've seen, and I'm very interested in understanding how, how you solve these challenges, um, th this is not very easy with the, the, the typical set of, uh, of tools that are available. Um, and <clears throat> because we also want to talk about machine learning today, um, I think the, the way machine learning plays into that is also very limited with, with the traditional tool set um, because it really plays into the, the elasticity argument. So you can measure elasticities via, um, via machine learning. And to some extent, it can be used for, for value pricing. So to understand how much customers value certain products, but it's, it's not really clear how machine learning would play into something like a competitor pricing, um, because the, the main challenge there is identifying, finding the, com the proper pr competitor prices, um, and that's, that's, of course, a machine task, but it's not something that's typically related to machine learning. So <clears throat> from, from our perspective, there are two main challenges that can be addressed using machine learning. The first one is, um, and that relates very closely, as I said, to, to elasticity-based pricing and to um, in some extent to value-based pricing when considering clustering, for example, is demand estimation. So understanding how customers respond to changes. And the second challenge is the price or the portfolio optimization. So once you understand how demand works, how demand reacts to a price change or a product change, then I then using that information to find the optimum. Uh, and the second part is actually fairly trivial. For example, for one product, um, if you know a product's price elasticity and you know your margin, it's very easy to see where the price optimum would be because margin times elasticity is minus one in the optimum. In a portfolio situation or where you look at um, competitor reactions, so you have a few dozen products that are, for example, in, uh, in, in competition with each other, it uh, becomes <clears throat> a bit more challenging, but typically you only have a few million cases. So it's really simple for a machine to iterate through these cases. It's of course very difficult for us humans, but for a machine, it's very easy. So the, the optimization part is actually 
fairly simple. So the challenge is always in the estimating the demand. And I think there are two main techniques that are being used in the field. One is, is clustering. So understanding what products have are similar, for example, in sensitivity or what products are similar in, in uh, how their value is perceived by customers. So that's the one challenge, clustering. And the other one is estimating then for individual products or clusters of products, the price volume relationship to determine something like a price elasticity. And in our experience, this is most of the time, time done via some regression analysis, um, classical regression analysis or a uh, machine learning variation of it. So these are the parts where, um, where we see that uh, machine learning is being used but we find that there are some challenges that come with this approach. And I think um, the, the main challenge is in how they are, the results are used, particularly how something like a price elasticity is being used, because we very often see um, when we come in that um, our customers of us use price elasticities and they, from a provider or some other source, get lists of price elasticities and they say, okay, this product has a price elasticity of minus two, this one has a price elasticity of minus 2.3 and so on. But the problem with it, with it is that the price elasticity is almost never constant. So for example, if you change the price of your product, um, for example, you increase it by, my, by 10%, as in this example, then the price elasticity increases from minus two to minus 2.7. So already a major shift uh, in particular in an environment where with inflation, a 10% price, price increase is, is something that, that, that's quite normal. Um, so um, it doesn't really make sense to, to have this, or it's, it's not very useful to have this, this one number, the minus two, uh, because it changes if you change a price, but it also changes a lot when a competitor changes something. For example, a competitor introduces a new product, then the price elasticity of your products uh, can be affected. Um, or if anything happens in the market, price elasticities change a lot. And having a list of price elasticity is, is, is not, not very useful as an input for, for good price decisions. Um, well, we're already talking about prices. There, there are more challenges than this. One is <clears throat> that, uh, and this here is based um, on, a, on a real example that we have. And it's typical, I would say, when you look at uh, price uh, sales unit relationships is that the relationship is not not linear um, and in this case it's also not exponential which is the the other type of demand function that's that's very common in the field so um, you, you you not only need to know the price elasticity but you also need to know what the essentially what the demand curve looks like so is it linear is it exponential or is it as sure shaped as in this case here. So th these are important things. And um, I think because we're already in an environment with increasing inflation, they let's look at an inflation uh, example to highlight why this is important. And I think when you, a, a, a typical question is, is that you have a product, let's say here in this case, the product has costs of, of 100, it's currently priced at 200. So at a price elasticity, that's the, prof that's the profit optimal price. And now what happens is that your costs increase. Uh, and the question is, or what we're trying to show here is, <clears throat> how do you pass on this, this cost increase? Um, depends a lot on what your demand function is, is shaped like. So if you have a linear demand function, you see that you should pass on half of the absolute price increase. So if you have a the cost increase from 100 to 110, you should increase your end consumer price by five euros. So you should go from 200 to 205. If you have an exponential demand function, you should pass on the percentage change. So you have a 10% increase in your costs and then you should also increase your price by 10 percent. so you should go from 200 to 220 euros so the difference between this is massive in the case of reasonable uh, price uh, price increases so just knowing that the price elasticity is minus two even if that's correct at the current price is not very helpful if you don't know what 
the demand function is really sh shaped like. So you need to always need to know more than that. And I think that's coming back to the machine learning part is because many have as a result of their machine learning algorithms, this price elasticity um, <clears throat> value that's been reported. Th that's, that's a lot of effort to produce a number that's in the end, not very helpful. Uh, and that for us was one of the motivations to approach the topic in a different way and use the, the power of machine learning and, uh, and other current methods in, in a more flexible way to produce significantly better, better outcomes. And the idea, uh, just very briefly, uh, we have a lot of material on, on the methods that, that, uh, that we have developed is that uh, we have developed something like a virtual shopper. So it's really, it's not one shopper, but it's thousands or millions of virtual shoppers and they have different preferences. They can be rational, they can be irrational, just like real people. And they have different preferences for different products, for brands, for example, and uh, certain distributions. And these distributions, how these preferences of these virtual shoppers are distributed, we estimate using the available data, for example, sales data or surveys or studies. And um, the way we do that using our machine learning algorithms, um, we can also combine different data sources uh, to optimize or make these virtual shoppers more realistic. And then what, what can be done with these, once you have the preferences of each of these virtual shoppers, you can show them your offer or also the products of your competitors at different price, at, at, at a current price or different prices. And then they will tell you each one of them what they would buy. And if you then change the price of a product, you get these demand functions here. And if you have these, it's very easy to to get the, the revenue and profit curves of each uh, product. And of course, what we can't show on a slide, but what we can show in the tool is um, that <clears throat> um, if you change the price of one product, that also affects the other product. So um, if let's say we increase the price of product two, some cus virtual customers here will find product two less attractive and move to products one or three. And that also helps us understand the interaction between different products. So that's a method that's very natural. And um, because we talked about the demand function previously uh, with this, the, the outcome. So you have here in the graph, different demand functions. It's something that's produced by the model and doesn't have to be assumed beforehand. And the, the way these demand functions look depends on the data that was used to generate the virtual shoppers. And if you look forward, these are fairly um, flexible in their use. Um, <clears throat> just have to hurry up a little bit. So here's one example and for one product. So we one way to generate them is have a training set of data use understand what they bought in the past, use it to derive their preferences, and then use it to estimate how um, they would react or what they would buy in the future. This is just for one product, but we're not looking at individual products, but behind each of them or within the same market, we have, a, I don't know, a dozen or a couple of dozen products that are being offered in the same period and that these virtual shoppers can choose from. And with that, method like this is able to uh, also understand even if this price here for this product is the same maybe in week 34 and 35 the difference is produced by changes in some other product so this can be used for this case but it can also be used that was a uh, consumer goods example but it can also be used for other indexes so this is a telco example where you have an offer with different products a bis a to e and what this example shows is that with the method, we were able to optimize the price of each product so that the overall revenue was optimal. And in this case, significant was able the, the method was able to produce significant uplift in, um, in, in sales and in revenue per customer because <clears throat> customers bought more expensive products from the way the, the portfolio was set up. Um, and just to conclude, just give you, I think um, Paul, we, we will do another webinar focused exclusively on, on, uh, on inflation, but just to give you a flavor of um, what this looks like in practice, uh, what I just outlined in theory. 
let's look if, before we go to the questions, a final look. Can you see my browser? Yes, if you want to zoom in, in a little bit, I think then it's perfect. And feel yes. free to ask questions in the chat or the q and I already see some in the Q&A. Oops. Um, yeah, so just just very, just two minutes, uh, and then we go to the the questions. So what I've done here is we're looking at a at a simplified portfolio. We have four products, uh, different. We're selling peanuts at different sizes. We have three competitor products from competitor A and competitor B, and it's set up realistically where we have different sizes, thousand and so on, different product sizes. We have the different brands, our own brand and the competitor brands. We could introduce promotions, which makes sense if we look at a weekly level, which we don't do in this example. We have costs, we have our trade terms, everything, and customer price, list, list price. And we can look at different price points if we want. And what the solution does, so what we've done based on uh, historical data, we have created the preferences of the virtual shoppers here. They are in the background. There are a few thousands of them. And at the current prices, they make uh, these sales here. And you can see if I change a price, then, um, then here I've increased the price a bit. I will use some sales. I see the price elasticity. And when I then, for example, change also another product's price, uh, this affects also the price elasticity of the first product. It went down from 5.5 to 3.4 because um, the closest alternative here has become a bit less attractive with a higher price. So fewer customers move from this to this product. And this allows us to look at all the interaction in the market. And when I then look at the um, inflation example that I mentioned, uh, let me just simplify this a bit. So we have here two cases. This is the, the, the case that I just looked at. And then we look at a second case where we have 20% cost increase. Um, then, and we want to understand what that means for the market. So because if I, before passing on the cost increase, I see that, of course, I'd sell the same number of units. Revenue is the same, but my profit is less because my costs have increased and I haven't done anything. Um, and I would be interested now in understanding what happens if I also increase my price here in this example by 20%, then I see that my profit nominally actually increases a bit, um, but money is worth a little less because we have a high inflation in this case, but I see that increasing my, my prices makes sense um, compared to the case where I don't increase my prices. I can also look at scenarios for example what happens and we're always looking here at profit what happens if i um if my competitors follow also increase their price by 20 percent i see of course because customers have fewer alternatives profit is higher in this case but i can also look at something like a downsizing case where um, we reduce the the package of everything keep the price the same so we go from a thousand kilograms to 800 from 750 to 600 and so on so reduce the package by 20 by about 20 percent in each case and we see okay in this case this option is less attractive and we can of course also look at a very high number of uh, combinations of the two methods so this is just a, a short teaser i would say um, to highlight how um, we in our solution use machine learning here to create these virtual shoppers and i said the difficult part is understanding how price and sales depend on each other. The easier part is, and that's what's been done here in the solution, is then using that to optimize your offer. So because that's actually, in our case, just counting these virtual shoppers to measure how much they would buy given each, each case. And then you can, it's very simple to go through these different cases and understand um, what would happen. And it allows you to make very quick um, we just did it in a few minutes and very informed and precise decision on how to react to something like a, a cost increase of your products um, and have something right at your hand for making better decisions, particularly in a situation like now where, where, where a lot of is going on in terms of pricing, cost change and everything. 
and uh, I think it helps a lot to have a tool that's that's fast and gives quick answers. <clears throat> Sorry, Great. I think we 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 spent one or two more minutes than we intended. Uh, but let's go that's to the. Good. I still see a lot of people here. Um, someone's already asking where can I get a replay of this webinar? You get it by email. Um, so watch watch your inbox. Um, we'll send it out usually on Mondays, Tuesdays after the webinar, just because we have to do some editing, uploading, and that kind of stuff. So check your email um, for that. Ingo, do you want to go to the next slide? Um, regarding questions, um, there were some in the Q&A. Um, one was, so you mentioned in the beginning all these different, um, different pricing methods and uh, also alluded a little bit of when, when to use what, um, but can you clarify someone's asking, um, are there certain methods that are more or less useful in, in certain circumstances? So out of the, the standard methods, I think they're, they're saying. Um, and you, you spoke a little bit about um, the cost uh, based rep. Maybe you can, it can clarify a little bit. Yeah. About that. So um, if little, so if, if, a, if an industry is, is not very dynamic, so if it has evolved for a long time and not a lot is changing, I think, um, the, as, I, as I said, something like cost plus is not, not that bad if it has evolved over a long time and there are a few changes in the industry. Different methods, something like elast elasticity-based pricing makes sense when there's a lot changing in an industry um, and you need to respond to, um, for example, or, um, cost changes, then I think um, having like a rough idea on, on how the demand reacts to, to price changes is very useful. If you're in an environment with a lot of competition, uh, positioning yourself to, to a competitor is of course very useful, particular if you, if for example, if you're a, a smaller player and it, it, with limited resources, it can make a lot of sense to just follow your competitors um, and let them do the, the more difficult work of setting the, the right price. Um, for for anyone who's who's not in, in a simple situation like that, um, I, I think it's it, it's very difficult, and that's I think for us why we developed our solution because um, I, we we felt that none of the existing solution really gives a proper answer to to the key questions of how to set your prices in a in an environment where there are multiple products that customers can choose from different channels we haven't gone into this today but do you have the complexity and lots of choices and you need to bring um, the effects of competitor price changes cost changes um, your own ideas on how to extend or, or reduce your portfolio together and i think uh, also on my past experience Everything else is, is is much less capable than than the solution we built that very naturally, I, I hope I could highlight that, uh, bring together all of these different ideas into one coherent method that's, that's really easy to and fast to use. Um, I don't think there is anything that I've seen else that properly brings together all of these concepts. Um, I think I always find it funny. I, at one, I think it was even a, a software company that also had price recommendations based on elast price elasticities, value pricing, behavioral, and so on, machine learning something. And in the end, they they just took the average of of these different price recommendations that came from these methods, and that 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 really can't be right, um, particularly if if the spread between the answers, I think one of them was like more than twice the recommendation that came from a different method. If, if the spread is so large, then there's something wrong with some of these methods and it wouldn't be proper to, to combine them. <clears throat> and um, that for us is the, the main motivation to build what, what we're building. Great. Um, yeah, someone, Carlos was, Pricing, I um, I sent the link for our behavioral pricing webinar in the chat, so check that out if you're interested. Maybe that's a good cue to the next slide, Ingo, um, just uh, yep. giving a heads up on our next topic. Um, so I think a lot of people were asking about pricing amid high inflation. Can you tell our viewers today a little bit of what to expect in that webinar? 
and uh, you'll get the invites by email as well. Yeah, um, I, I think uh, t today we the example we showed towards the end, uh, we sort of highlighted um, what the tool can be used for with a simple or a very simple inflation case. We will dig a, a bit deeper into that, um, looking at different, um, giving a bit more background on, on the topic of inflation, what to expect, and then also looking more practically how to best respond to it, um, particularly if you have products that are maybe differently affected by by uh, by cost increases. Um, and we will talk about how to best manage that within the full complexity of, of, rev of revenue management, um, considering your perspective, considering the perspective of, of retailers and other participants and how to best bring this all together. A uh, very good ending, I think, here. Um, thanks, Ingo. If there are no more questions, um, I think that I'll, I'll see you at the next webinar on inflation end of April. Um, check your inbox uh, for the invites and also for the recording, and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Have a, have a great weekend. Speak soon. Bye-bye.